Dearly beloved, we have come together in the presence of God to witness the joining together of this man and this woman in holy matrimony. The sacred relationship of marriage was established by God in creation, and our Lord Jesus Christ adorned marriage by his presence and first miracle at the wedding in Cana of Galilee. Now, obviously we're not performing a wedding today, but we are talking about covenant as we continue in our core 52 series of the core 52 verses of the Bible. A couple of weeks ago, we looked at creation. You're not an accident. We looked at identity. You're made in the image of God. You have purpose and meaning given by God. And last week, we looked at the fall, and we have suffered the consequences as a race ever since. And today, we are going to be looking at covenant. This is a little minister's manual. Any minister or pastor out there has one of these, is quite familiar. It tells you how to do weddings and funerals and all the churchy stuff that we have to do once in a while. But we've come to the Olney Community Church here on Highway 202 in Olney because I wanted some place that was kind of old-fashioned and looked like a nice spot for someone to have a wedding. So that's why we're out here in Olney. Now, covenant is not a word that we use a whole lot, but a marriage ceremony is actually a covenant. Now, a covenant, as we're going to see in just a little bit, basically has three parts. You have the parties who are going to agree to the covenant. You have the terms, what each one agrees to do. And then you have the promises or the rewards or the consequences or the curses, however you want to look at it, uh, if someone fails to live up to their end of the covenant. But covenant is a tremendous biblical word, it's, and marriage is appropriate to make the connection to God's covenant in the Bible, because in the scriptures, God quite often refers to his relationship with his people in terms of marriage. For example, in Ezekiel chapter 16, it's a, it's a gruesome chapter. If you kind of like reading some of the grosser parts of the Bible, you got to go check out Ezekiel chapter 16. I've never heard a sermon. I did one once, actually. Um, but God talks about the nation of Israel as being a baby that he found and he raised, he adopted, he grew up and then married her. And then she turned into a prostitute and walked away from him. But the whole imagery there is one of marriage. In Ephesians chapter 5, the apostle Paul talks about the relationship between Jesus Christ and his church as, as a mystery, kind of like marriage. It's, it's, it's a mystery, and, and when we're connected to God by faith, there's this marriage mystery relational thing going on. Jesus himself in the Gospels quite often referred to himself as the bridegroom. Uh, the last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 22, there's a tremendous invitation. The spirit and the bride say, come. So this idea of marriage and covenant it's quite appropriate as we begin to take a look at how God relates to people, how God has chosen to relate to the human race in terms of covenant. For instance, your Bible is divided into two parts, Old Testament and New Testament. That word testament is basically the same word as covenant. Old covenant, new covenant. The Old Covenant, the Old Testament, Basically, that's Moses, the Ten Commandments, the agreement that God made with the Israelites um, when they were moving towards the Promised Land at Mount Sinai. It, it's, it's what they needed to do. You move to the New Testament, and it's all about Jesus. It's his death on the cross. It's his empty tomb. It's his resurrection. And the emphasis shifts, and this is critically important, not from what you do, but to what Jesus did did. Biggest difference between the Old and the New Testaments. Now, there are a number of significant covenants in the Old Testament, and then, of course, the covenant that we have with 
Jesus, represented by communion or the Lord's Supper. We're going to take a look at a couple of those as we go through this message. Someone said one time it's better to wave at a mountain than to excavate a molehill. So we're, we're going to be waving at some pretty big mountains today. Put on your seatbelt, tie a knot, hang on. We're going to go for, I think, a pretty cool ride and see what does the Bible say about covenant and especially with Abraham, because we're coming to Abraham now in the book of Genesis. Now, as I mentioned, a covenant generally has three parts. You've got the parties, you've got the terms or the conditions, and then you've got the rewards or the consequences if you obey or if you disobey the covenant. And quite often in the Bible, there was blood involved, a sacrifice, which showed how serious you were taking this covenant relationship. And it also... It also pointed to the consequences if you don't keep the covenant. What we just did to this animal, may it be done to me as a signatory to this covenant. A powerful example of that is, I'm going to guess a pretty unfamiliar passage from Jeremiah chapter 34. What's happened is... The Israelites have freed all the Hebrew slaves. The law of Moses said every seven years they had to let them go. They've apparently made a covenant before God, and they let their slaves go, and then they reneged, and they brought them all back and re-enslaved them. And God, speaking through the prophet Jeremiah, is furious. Now, listen to what he says here, and keep in mind what we just talked about blood and sacrifice being a part of covenant. Jeremiah chapter 34, beginning at verse 17. Therefore, this is what the Lord says. You have not obeyed me. You have not proclaimed freedom to your own people. So I now proclaim freedom for you, declares the Lord. Freedom to fall by the sword, plague, and famine. I will make you abhorrent to all the kingdoms of the earth. Those who have violated my covenant and have not fulfilled the terms of the covenant they made before me, I will treat like the calf they cut in two and then walked between its pieces. The leaders of Judah and Jerusalem, the court officials, the priests, and all the people of the land who walked between the pieces of the calf, I will deliver into the hands of their enemies who want to kill them. Their dead bodies will become food for the birds and the wild animals. So when they made this blood covenant to release their slaves, they made sacrifices, walked between them, basically saying, if we renege, may it be done to us as has been done to these animals. And that's exactly what happened. They did not keep their end of the bargain. And God says, okay, now I'm going to enforce the covenant and you will get exactly what you understood would happen if you didn't keep this covenant. This becomes very important in just a little bit when we look at Genesis chapter 15 and one of the most bizarre visions recorded in the scriptures. Now the ancient Middle East type of treaty or covenant that we're talking about, the technical word is suzerainty. Fancy word I know, you probably haven't heard it a whole lot. I don't think I've used it since my Bible college days, so it kind of feels good to throw it out there. What this type of treaty is, the word suzerainty means overlord, and a suzerainty treaty means that the greater party dictates to the lesser party. So there's no bartering, there's no negotiating, there's no discussion. The, the, the one who has all the power basically stipulates to the lesser party, this is the way it is take it or leave it. The only choice is, am I going to accept this or reject this? You don't get to dicker with the terms of the covenant. We see that today, for instance, with mortgages or, or car loans. You, you go to the bank to get a mortgage and you pull out of your, your briefcase, by the way, here's the terms, here's how it's going to work. They're probably going to say, I don't think so. You walk into the car dealership and, and say, okay, uh, here's the terms, guys. Let's use my paperwork. No, it's kind of a suzerainty relationship there. They, they're going to tell you, here's how it's going to be. You don't like it. Go down the street, talk to somebody else. In the Bible, God is the greater party. There's no negotiating with him. He sets the terms. So Adam and Eve, the first covenant, there was no discussion. God says, you can eat freely of any of the trees in the garden, but of this one, don't eat. And 
you will live. Eat of the fruit of this tree and you will die. And it's not like Adam says, well, now, Lord, let's, let's talk about that. What if we really want to eat of that tree? How can we make that happen? No discussion. This or that. It's how God works. He's the greater party. So let's start with Abraham's covenant. His name was Abram, and then it was changed to Abraham, which God quite often did with characters in the scriptures. He gave them new names as evidence that he was working in their life. In Genesis chapter 12, Abram is living in what is probably modern-day Iraq somewhere, and, and God says, I want you to leave your people and go to a land I will show you, and I'll give you better land, more land, and a bigger family. So those were the promises. Leave, and here's what I will give you. In Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, we're told that Abram believed the promises of God and that God credited his faith to him as righteousness. Big, fancy, theological church word there, righteousness. But what it means, basically, is you are right with God. So because of Abram's faith, he's trusting what God has said he's going to do, God is pleased with that and looks at him and says, you're righteous, I, I don't see sin, which is good. You don't want God to look at you and see sin. The Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 4, verse 3, is going to quote this very verse from Genesis chapter 15 as an argument because something has come up in the New Testament church and it says, in order to become a Christian, you've got to become a Jew. And the mark of a Jew was circumcision. And so Paul is going back to Genesis and saying, when, when Abraham or Abram was credited as righteous before God, he had not yet been circumcised. Well, guess what? That means you don't have to be circumcised. You don't have to become Jewish in order to have a right standing with God. It was, it was a huge argument in the early church. And then we come to Genesis chapter 15, which is probably one of the most bizarre passages in the entire Bible. Abraham has a, a little bit of a uh, doubt, you might say, which I find encouraging because he's the father of the faithful. And yet several times in his story, his faith does not appear to be all that strong. And he says, God, how do I know you're really going to do all these great things for me? And so God says, cut up a bunch of animals. He tells them what kind of animals. Lay them down in, in a row. And then he goes into a deep sleep and he has a vision where he sees a smoking fire pot and, and a fiery torch pass through these slaughtered animal pieces. And scholars agree that that is the presence of God. It probably represents his judgment and his holiness. But God is walking through the pieces of these slaughtered animals as part of the covenant he's making with Abram or Abraham. And what he's saying is, if, if I fail to keep this covenant, may it be done to me as you just did to these animals. May I be sacrificed. May my blood be shed. And what's really cool is Abraham doesn't walk through those pieces. God walks through the pieces stating, may the curse be upon me if this covenant isn't kept. That's, that's very significant. Imagine if you default on your car loan or your mortgage payment and the car dealer or the bank says, we got it, we, we got you covered. That's what's happening here. God himself is promising to eat it if you break the covenant. That looks ahead to Jesus Christ, as we'll see in just a moment. Now we come to Genesis chapter 17, where God institutes circumcision as a sign of the covenant that he's making with Abraham. And through Abraham, those who are his spiritual children, which would be the church, and those who 
follow Islam. Abram is their physical father through Ishmael, because as I mentioned, he doubted and he decided that, well, maybe because he's so old and he and his wife couldn't have a child, he would have a child with his wife's handmaid named Hagar. Hagar had Ishmael and Ishmael became the physical father of the nations of Islam. So pretty much three out of five people on this planet can trace a spiritual or physical connection back to this guy, Abraham. So what we're talking about with covenant is really, really important. So then we come to Genesis chapter 22. Again, I'm mean, looking at all these freaky stories in the Bible today. God makes an unconscionable demand on Abraham. Go ahead and read that. Takes him to this mountain, tells him to sacrifice his one and only son, his miracle son, Isaac, who had finally been born to him at about 100 years old, through whom God is going to give him all these promises, descendants as many as the stars in the sky, and we know there are billions and billions of stars in the sky, and God says, I want you to take him up the mountain, tie him to an altar, put a knife through his heart, and kill him. I know people who have turned away from God because of this very passage. They read that and they say, a God that would ask that of a human being is not worthy of being followed. And I get that. Except they fail to understand what God is doing here. For one thing, it didn't happen. That execution did not take place. But there, there was a, a foretelling, a prophecy. Isaac's He's no dummy. We don't know how old he is here, but he's no dummy. Like, Dad, I got the rope. I got the fire. Where's the sacrifice? In verse 8 of Genesis chapter 15, Abram, Abraham says to his son, God will provide himself a sacrifice. Now, a ram was caught in the thicket, and that's eventually what was sacrificed on top of that mountain. But that wording, God will provide himself a sacrifice, which is how the King James says it. God himself will provide a sacrifice. Points towards the time when God would himself lay down his life for the sins of the world. Hopefully you're hearing an echo of the Gospel of John in here. Remember when when John the Baptist saw Jesus walking and he says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This is not a coincidence. We're talking at least 17, 1800 years before the time of Jesus. His faith was credited to him as righteousness. God himself will provide a sacrifice. This is part of God's plan from the beginning of creation all through the New Testament right up until today. The writer of Hebrews really drills down on this in Hebrews chapter 11. It's the faith chapter of the Bible. But at verse 17, by faith Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so in a matter of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. The reason Abraham was willing to sacrifice his son was because God had made a promise. And although he didn't understand the reasoning behind what God was telling him to do, he understood he served a God who kept his promise. So if God said, kill the kid, God could raise the kid back up to life and keep his promise. Jesus fleshes this out in Matthew chapter 26 at, at the communion table, the Lord's Supper, the, the Last Supper with his disciples. 
This is, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. It's not some capricious, violent, unreasonable God back in Genesis 22. It's the God who knows what he's doing, and he's had a plan in place since the creation of the world to get humans, you and me, out of our sin predicament. At Calvary, God would offer his one and only son, his miracle son. He would offer him as a blood sacrifice to pay for the sins of the world. And there would be no stopping of the sacrifice this time. There would be no angelic interruption of the sacrifice as happened back in Genesis chapter 22. There were thousands of angels Jesus could have called to get him out of that situation, but he willingly allowed himself to go to the cross to pay the price of covenant breaking that you and I deserve to pay. That's what the gospel is all about. Genesis chapter 15, Genesis chapter 22, Matthew chapter 26, it's all part of the same story. I hope you can see that. They all point to what it costs God to provide salvation for the human race. That is the gospel. You can't earn it. You can't pay for it. You can't be good enough. You can't keep enough rules. All you can do is accept what someone else has done on your behalf. As a matter of fact, every covenant in the Bible is either fulfilled by Jesus or points to Jesus. Jesus shows up in Genesis chapter 3 in in, in the consequence that God announces to the three of them, Adam and Eve and the serpent. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and wild animals. You're going to crawl on your belly. You'll eat dust all the days of your life. And then verse 15, and I will put enmity or that strife or hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. Interesting, not the man's offspring, the woman's offspring. Echoes of the virgin birth. Hello. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. That's called the Proto-Evangelium, the first announcing of the gospel. He will crush your head. This child, this seed of woman will deliver a fatal blow to the serpent. And all he's going to do is bruise your heel. If your heel gets bruised, you're probably not going to die from it. It hurts, but it's temporary. It's not fatal. So right off the bat, Jesus shows up in Genesis chapter 3. You move ahead a couple chapters in Genesis, chapter 6 through 9, you have the story of Noah. God decides he's going to wipe out the human race. He's going to start again with Noah. Noah's told, here's the covenant, build a boat, put your family in it, you'll be spared. He builds the boat, puts his family in it, and they're spared. That points to the gospel. Again, going to the New Testament, 1 Peter chapter 3. Talking about the flood and Noah and the ark. Beginning at verse 20, he says, In it, the ark, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the appeal to God for a clean conscience. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels and authorities and powers in submission to him. Baptism is foretold in the Noah story, and the Apostle Peter says, Baptism is where you cry out to God for a clean conscience. The root word for appeal there means prayer to cry out to God. Baptism is a sinner's prayer. Clear teaching of the New Testament is that when you want to cry out to God, 
and say, save me. It takes place in the waters of baptism. We'll see that here a little bit more. It's, it's not a church or a man-made teaching. It's a clear teaching of Scripture. Baptism, for some people, is home plate. It's like, oh, I got baptized, now I'm done. No. I like what one preacher said. He says, baptism is more like first base. You're on base now. You're in the game. Now you've, you've got things to do. But that's another sermon for another time. So that's the covenant with Noah. The covenant God made with Moses, we know as the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai. At the end of Deuteronomy has a tremendous chapter on blessings and cursings in there. Basically, what the Mosaic Covenant was, was God gave an intricate legal system to the Jewish people, all sorts of things governing all their lives, and they had to follow. Very, very intricate, uh, well over 600 commands the rabbis have deduced. And what Israel's history shows us is that <laughs> rules without relationship result in rebellion. And for all of Israel's history, they were constantly rebelling against God. I have said for so long now, the only thing God's ever wanted out of his people were a people that reflected his character. He didn't just want them obeying his rules. He wanted them to look like him. And the rules were to serve that purpose. Paul would later say in the New Testament, actually, the purpose of the law was to show us that we can't keep the law. What the law shows us is that we need more than rules to save us. As Jesus would say to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, Nicodemus was a rule-keeping Pharisee whose understanding of righteousness was doing all these things and keeping all these rules. Jesus would look at him and say, no, no, Nick, 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 yo, Nick, look at me, Nick. You must be born again. It's a spiritual birth. It's not rule-keeping. Basically, that's why they put Jesus on the cross, because they saw that he was teaching against the law of Moses. Now, this doesn't mean that the law is unimportant. Jesus said in, in Matthew chapter 5, he says, I, I've not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. Now, the law is very, very important. The, the fact is, though, that no human being can keep the law. Listen to what Paul writes in Colossians chapter 2, beginning at verse 11. Paul, remember, is a former Pharisee. He knows what it is to, to have his whole spiritual identity built on achievement and accomplishment and doing religious things that impress God. And he knows what it is to walk away from that and realize what a crock of hooey, although he used stronger language than that. Listen to what he writes in Colossians chapter 2. Talking about this whole relationship between Jesus and the law and faith. In Jesus, you were also circumcised. <laughs> There's that circumcision. It changes now from the physical flesh that was done to Abraham and his descendants. Now it's a spiritual deal. Where does it happen? Pay attention. In Jesus, you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self, ruled by the flesh, was put off when you were circumcised by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism. There's the baptism again. In which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. So I've got this moral legal system out there that I can't possibly keep. And Jesus, by his sacrifice, nails it to the cross. I'm no longer condemned. And when I put my faith in him, and I go under the waters of baptism, trusting him, he does spiritual surgery, spiritual circumcision. He hears my cry for salvation and declares me righteous, not because of anything I did, but because I have, I have followed the terms of the new covenant, 
and trusted Jesus Christ to walk through those slaughtered pieces of meat and take the price of sin for me and for you. The next covenant we come to is David. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 16. God has anointed David as king, and he says, <laughs> you will have an heir on your throne forever and ever. This will be an everlasting kingdom. Unfortunately, it wasn't. There was a long period of time where there were no kings at all. There was no throne. There was no kingdom. Remember Luke chapter 1, the angel Gabriel comes to Mary and he says, you're going to have a son, I want you to name him Jesus, and, and God will give him the throne of his father David, and his kingdom will have no end. His kingdom is the church. We know from other scriptures, the kingdom of God is now not the physical land of Israel. That has served its purpose. The Jewish people have served their purpose. Their role was to bring Messiah into the world so that what was promised to Abraham, that all nations on earth would be blessed through him, that's done. And now God's kingdom is his church. It is so cool how the covenants of the Old Testament were either fulfilled by Jesus or point to Jesus. In fact, it's safe to say that Jesus is the subject of the entire Bible. Take, for example, Israel, their, their rebellion, their exile, their return. All of that foretells the return of Jesus. Moses delivered them from slavery. Jesus, the great deliverer, delivers us from our sin. And when he comes back and shows up, just like Moses did, he's going to make everything right again. The whole Bible is all about Jesus. You can't understand it without looking through the eyes of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the great covenant fulfiller. God himself walking between the rows of slaughtered pieces of animals, taking in himself the punishment for the covenant that we broke that he will never break. If you're a follower of God through Jesus Christ, he will keep his promises to you. The question is, will you continue to trust him? Just like Abraham trusted him in Genesis chapter 22. Covenant faith, by the way, isn't just intellectual agreement. Oh yeah, I, I believe Jesus existed. I, I believe he did those things. It's not just moral agreement. Yeah, I, I think Jesus did the right thing. He brought, taught the right thing, brought the right message. It's covenant faith is because I believe, I do. It does something. Something in your life must show your faith. James says, be doers of the word, not hearers only. A little bit later, he would say, faith without works is dead. What in your life gives evidence to God and to others that your trust and your faith is in God? Remember, we talked about baptism, not being home plate, but first base. As a follower of Jesus, what are you doing? with your faith? How is it changing you? What risk are you taking? What are you trusting? What are you giving over to God, trusting Him to do? Very important question. And so there's a very important question. If, if you've never made a decision for Jesus Christ, if you're not sure of your relationship with Jesus Christ, remember we started at the beginning with, with a wedding ceremony. Jesus Christ would love to be in a covenant relationship with you. That's the only kind of relationship he can have with anybody. This is my blood of the new covenant, remember? He would love for you to be a part of that. So let me just ask you, when it comes to your relationship with God through Jesus Christ, where are you? Are you single? <laughs> 
just not going to accept it? Are you separated? We, yeah, we were married once, but now I'm kind of going my other way here. Not really sure I want to stay in this relationship. Having second thoughts, it's not what I thought it would be. Or I was a follower of Jesus when I was a kid, but now I'm an adult. Kind of outgrown it. Are you divorced? Yeah, I had a relationship with Christ once, but for whatever reason, now I'm going that way. I know friends who were solid followers of Jesus, and because of a number of circumstances in their lives, they have nothing to do with them now. Jesus lets us walk into the covenant. He lets us walk out of the covenant. Is that you? Or are you, are you married happily to Jesus Christ? Are you all in? Every day, getting to know him more, live for him more, enjoy him more. Not because you have to, but because he's worth knowing. He loves you, and he loves watching you grow in your love for him. That would be my prayer for you. What are you going to do with the greatest proposal you're ever going to get? I hope it is to say yes to Jesus Christ, to trust what he has done for you, to put your faith in him, to go into the waters of baptism, be immersed, crying out to him, for salvation and trusting him to nail your debt to the cross and then live for him and with him the rest of your days. It's the only life worth living. My name's Jim Doer, preaching guy with the Astoria Christian Church. We meet that way a couple miles, 1151 Harrison Avenue, 1030 on Sunday mornings if you're in the area. We would love for you to join us. Again, we're looking working through Core 52. We've got some extra books. If you're in the area, stop by. We'll give you a free book. We'd love to see you. We are at the only community church in the rain talking about what it's like to be married, the covenant that connects you and your God. Thanks for joining us. Have a great week. See you next week.